Tracesboro, Ohio, and welcome to St. Thomas Lutheran Church. This is our Good Friday Tap for Pin and Brace service here at 7.30 here in downtown of Streetsboro. Broadcasting on 96.9 FM, low power here around the church, and we're running on Facebook at the same time, which is active at this time. Please enjoy the service.
Lord Jesus, you carried our sins in your own body on the tree so that we might have life. May we and all who remember this day find new life in you now and in the world to come, where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Good Friday comes upon us every year as a kind of bad habit we'd really like to quit. We don't like putting ourselves through this annual ritual of tears and sorrow. We want a faith that is upbeat, smiling, encouraging, maybe even fun. What a downer this day turns out to be. Part of that is just the sheer human emotive response we have to any story about death. We read accounts in the newspaper about this atrocity or that violent set of actions, and we recoil. How can people do such things to each other, we wonder in our hearts? At least until we had confront our own capacity for anger and outrage, and then only bear, uh, beat back barely the desire to lash out, fight back, repay, hurt the other person. We want to be convinced that we are not at all like those we read about who act with cruelty, hatred, disdain for others. But in our more brutal honesty moment, we realize we're different only by degree. Just hearing about the suffering that Jesus endures puts that lump solidly in our throats, brings that tear to our eyes, and covers us like a funeral pall. Part of it is also the injustice of it all. It's bad enough to think about someone going through such torment and grief because of the guilt of their own actions. But we are today aware that we're hearing about a man who is innocent, who just about everybody in the story knows is innocent, but who nonetheless is subjected to false accusations, beatings, insults, and finally one of the most cruel forms of capital punishment ever devised. Our sense of justice is upset at that treatment. We want someone to blame the Pharisees, Pilate, Judas, the crowd, the disciples. Of course, the last thing we want to do in this mood is to look in the mirror. 
Part of it is the feelings of guilt this day lays on us. We sing those words from the familiar hymn. Yet, O Lord, not this alone make me see your passion, but its cause to me make known and its termination. For I also in my sin wrought your deep affliction. This, the shameful cause has been of your crucifixion. We don't like that part. Being told that this death is our responsibility. We want to deny it. We want to proclaim our innocence. But we would just as soon not have anybody go too deeply into details. Because in the back of our minds and in our heart of hearts, we know this accusation is true. All the more reason not to like Good Friday. It not only makes us feel guilty, it reminds us that we truly are guilty. So we would just like to skip past Good Friday, thank you. We've already heard the sad story on Palm, uh, excuse me, Passion Sunday. Do we really need to dwell on, on it more? Can't we just celebrate that triumphant entry, and then have a nice supper in the upper room, and then just go gather at the empty tomb? We could, but should we? No. The thing about Good Friday is that you just can't avoid it. First of all, it happened. Ignoring what happened is hardly ever a good idea. If there was success and victory, we need to know how that happened in case we need to come back to it. If there was failure and setback, we need to know so that we don't repeat the problem and make the same mistakes. Simply sweeping something under the carpet of history provides nothing good. What we need to determine about Good Friday is, which was it? Mistake or success? Victory or failure? The tone tonight would suggest Good Friday is both a mistake and a failure. All the good folks in the story are in tears and shock. All the rotten actors are acting as if they won, or at least as, they, as if they solved their problem. But that's what comes of trying to ignore what happened. We wind up thinking that what happened was one thing, and it turns out to be just the opposite. Good Friday is often represented for the, as the failure that Easter then corrects. No. Good Friday is the victory. The tenth stanza of O Sacred Head Now Wounded reads, Be thou my consolation, my shield, when I must die. Remind me of your passion when my last hour draws nigh. My eyes shall then behold you. Upon your cross shall dwell. My heart by faith enfold you. Who dies thus, dies well. It is Jesus' death that we look to as the anchor for faith. It is Jesus' death that is the victory. This is that curious thing that God so regularly does with his creation. God uses what appears to be weakness to display his power. God enters into failure, and it becomes victory. God calls the least likely candidate to do his bidding, and then empowers that bad choice to do the very thing God desires. And we look at the record. Abraham, Moses, Aaron, Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, Peter, Paul. I could go on. Every last one of these flawed were flawed beyond use. But they were used by God in ways they could not have imagined and quite frankly, did not want to be used. There is an immediately apparent reason why God does things that way, so that we never wind up thinking it was our wonderfulness that got the task done. St. Paul said it this way, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is, <coughs> what is weak in the world to shame the strong. 
God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. Throughout time, God has acted in apparent weakness to work his will. There was nothing more central to God's will than that his son take our place to suffer the death we deserve. It happened. And we rejoice that it happened. We likewise cannot avoid Good Friday so that we comprehend its importance. That kind of victory needs to be studied and restudied so we can make sense of it. It is, on the face of it, a conundrum. In order to live, one must die. That makes no sense. We would have it read, to live, you must live. Hold on to life at all costs. But that's not God's manner. God's manner is to invite us to let go. Realize that life is in God's hands always. We are invited to surrender ourselves into those hands, just as did Jesus. The importance of Good Friday is that Jesus did so surrender. And not just at the final moment, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Throughout his life, Jesus was surrendered to the Father's will. He told us, Very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing on his own, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. Good Friday teaches us that we cannot avoid it without being faithless to God, to his will and his purpose for our lives. Lastly, if we seek to avoid Good Friday, we miss the most startling aspect of the entire episode. Jesus told Martha just before he raised her brother Lazarus from the dead, I am the resurrection and the life. Look at the cross right now and say to yourself, there hangs the resurrection and the life. I say that out loud. How can that be? How can resurrection and life die? Well, it can't, we say. Yet John records, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Again, a mystery. But then this whole incarnational thing is a mystery. We cannot explain it. We cannot understand it. We cannot avoid it. We have just one choice open to us. We must embrace it by faith. And so we gather this night. We come in silence, in proper respect for what we witness. We sit and listen. We become sad, tearful, maybe even a little angry. We probably don't emote as deeply as we should, but then we've heard this many times before, so some of the edge has been taken off. But we sing funereal hymns, and our mood deepens low. <clears throat> and we move to the very end, we will hear yet again the prophecies that made, pl made plain God's plan for this event throughout history. And as we move further into darkness as each prophecy is read, we come to better appreciate how his first followers must have felt as they helplessly watched the scene unfold. We too, we see where they lay him, and the candle of his presence is taken from this space and sealed away. And then as we entered, we shall leave in silence, and we'll be sad, downcast, sorrowful. We gather here because the Spirit has led us here. We gather because we need to hear again all that transpired to bring about our salvation and forgiveness. We gather here because we want to express our sorrow, our contrition for what brought all of this on Jesus. 
We gather so that we might better grasp and express the utter joy of Easter morning because it is so sharply in contrast with what we go through tonight. We gather, quite frankly, because we know this. You can't avoid it. Amen. We join in the hymn for the service. First lesson, a reading from the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told, they shall see. And that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured himself out to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Oh, Lord, don't forget. 
forsake me. Do you not hear my pain, Lord? Such trouble is near. There is no one to help. Don't forsake me. You brought me forth from the womb, Lord. I have been yours since my birth, Lord. You made me to trust from the time of the breast. Don't forsake me. My life pours out like the water. My bones are torn from their sockets. My heart turned to wax has now melted away. Don't forsake me. Lord, oh my Lord, don't forsake me. My strength is dried like a portrait. My tongue swells in thirst. I am laid in the dust. Don't forsake me. Dogs now surround me, my Lord. I am encircled by evil. My hands and my feet have been pierced. Here I hang. Don't forsake me. A second letter from the letter to the Hebrews. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. This is the word of the Lord. Alone, make me see your 
passion, but its cause to me make known, and its termination, for I also and my sin from affliction, this the shameful cause has been of your crucifixion. Let me view your pain and loss with repentant grieving, nor prepare again your cross by unholy living. May I give you love for love. Hear me, O my Savior, that I may in heaven above sing your praise forever. Passion of our Lord according to St. John. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came with, there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. He replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Was your incarnation? 
and your love unswerving. Not my deserving. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since the disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a char charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongfully, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to the Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. and shall it ever be a mortal man ashamed of thee ashamed of thee who angels praise whose glory shine through endless Days ashamed of Jesus, sooner far let evening blush to own a star. He shreds the beams of light divine for this. Be soul of mine ashamed of Jesus that dear friend on whom my hopes of heaven attend no when I blush be this my shame that I no more revere his name. Till then not is my boasting vain, till then I boast a Savior slain, and oh may this my glory be that Christ is not ashamed of me. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement, 
and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in the purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to him, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. 
Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die because he claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But, Pilate, but Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him. But the, Jew, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now, it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. 
There they crucified him, and with, it, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. 
A jar of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. <clears throat> then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Let us pray, brothers and sisters, for the Holy Church of God throughout the world. The God, the Almighty Father, guide it and gather it together so that we may worship him in peace and tranquility. Almighty and eternal God, you have shown your glory to all nations in Christ Jesus. Guide the work of the church. Help it to persevere in faith. Proclaim your name and bring salvation to people everywhere. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for Matthew, the president of our synod, and Jameson, the president of our district, for our pastors and other ministers, for all servants of the church, and for all the people of God. Almighty and eternal God, your spirit guides the church and makes it holy. 
Strengthen and uphold our pastors and our leaders. Keep them in health and safety for the good of the church. And help each of us to do faithfully the work to which you have called us. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all our brothers and sisters who share our faith in Christ Jesus. That God may gather and keep together in one church all those who know Christ as Lord. Almighty and eternal God, you give your church its unity. Look with favor on all who follow Jesus, your Son. We are all consecrated to you by our baptism. Make us one in the fullness of faith, and keep us one in the fellowship of love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the Jewish people, the first to hear the word of God, that they may receive the fulfillment of the covenant's promises. Almighty and eternal God, long ago you gave your promise to Abraham and his posterity. Hear the prayers of your church that the people you first made your own may arrive with us at the fullness of redemption. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not believe in Christ, that the light of the Holy Spirit may show them the way of salvation. Almighty and eternal God, enable those who do not acknowledge Christ to receive the truth of the gospel. Help us, your people, to grow in love for one another, to grasp more fully the mystery of your Godhead, and so to become more perfect witnesses of your love in the sight of all people. We ask this through Christ our Lord. <clears throat> Let us pray for those who do not believe in God that they may find him who is the author and goal of our existence. Almighty and eternal God, you created humanity so that all might long to know you and have peace in you. Grant that in spite of the hurtful things that stand in their way, they may all recognize in the lives of Christians the tokens of your love and mercy and gladly acknowledge you as the one true God and Father of us all. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who serve in public office, that God may guide their minds and hearts so that all of us may live in the true peace in true peace and freedom. Almighty and eternal God, you are the champion of the poor and the oppressed. In your goodness, watch over those in authority so that people everywhere may enjoy justice, peace, freedom, and a share of the goodness of your creation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray that God, the Almighty and Merciful Father, may heal the sick, comfort the dying, give safety to travelers, free those unjustly deprived of liberty, and rid the world of falsehood, hunger, and disease. Almighty and eternal God, you give strength to the weary and new courage to those who have lost heart. Hear the prayers of all who call on you in any trouble, that they may have the joy of receiving your help in their need. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Finally, let us pray for all those things for which our Lord would have us ask. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
Since it was the day of preparations, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Indeed, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you may also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission. So he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with spices in linen cloths according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there.
is brighter than the sun. May we, as we watch for morning, trust the victory you have won. As Prophecies concerning our Lord's passion, his betrayal by Judas, even my bosom friend in whom I trusted, who ate of my bread, has lifted the heel against me. Psalm 41, verse 9. The price of blood. So they weighed out as my wages 30 shekels of silver. Then the Lord said to me, throw it into the treasury this lordly price at which I was valued by them. So I took the thirty shekels of silver and threw them into the treasury in the house of the Lord. Zechariah 11, verses 12 and 13. He was accused by false witnesses. Malicious witnesses rise up. They ask me about things I do not know. They repay me evil for good. My soul is forlorn. Psalm 35, verses 11 and 12. He was smitten and spat upon. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. Isaiah 50, verse 6. He was hated without cause. More in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. Many are those who would destroy me, my enemies, who accuse me falsely. Psalm 69, verse 4. He suffered for others. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. His hands and feet are pierced. For dogs are all around me. A company of evildoers encircles me. My hands and feet have been pierced. I can count all my bones. Psalm 22, verses 16 and 17. He was mocked and insulted. All who see me mock at me. They make mouths at me. They shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver. Let him rescue the one in whom he delights. Psalm 22, verses 7 and 8. He was given vinegar and gall. They gave me poison for food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Psalm 69, verse 21. His garments were parted. 
They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. Psalm 22, verse 18. He was forsaken by God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Psalm 22, verse 1. His side was pierced. I, and I will pour out a spirit of compassion and supplication on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that when they look on the one whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. No bone of his was to be broken. He keeps all their bones. Not one of them will be broken. Psalm 34, verse 20. He was buried with the rich. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there's no deceit in his mouth. Isaiah 53, verse 9. His rest in the grave. For you did not give me up to Sheol, or let your faithful one see the pit. Psalm 16, verse 10.